On this week's edition of New York Now, New York has a new state budget with a $212 billion price tag. Then, state controller Tom DiNapoli joins us with his take on the state budget and the future of New York's finances. And later, Karen DeWitt from New York State Public Radio and Bill Mahoney from Politico join me with the latest. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Today, the Senate majority will pass a legislation we'll pass a law that prohibiting it, and, and we will take them the to court challenging it. Another stand uh, for New York and sending a message to the nation. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark. So what were you doing at 4 a.m. on Wednesday? For most of you, you were probably asleep, or at least I hope you were. But it was right about then that the state Senate was voting to pass this year's state budget. Yeah, at 4 a.m. The assembly followed the next day, giving final passage to $212 billion in spending over the next year. And if you're not familiar with the state budget, that might sound sort of boring. But lawmakers typically pack major policy items in the budget as well. Two years ago, it was bail reform. And there was plenty of that this year as well. But all eyes were really on the state's finances after the COVID-19 pandemic. Here's Governor Cuomo this week. Uh, this budget is uh, certainly the most robust, most impactful, uh, most important budget that we have done uh, in, in this state I believe in modern history. And with nearly $20 billion more in spending compared to last year, there's a lot to get through. Take a look. New York State will increase spending over the next year and do it in part by raising revenue from the state's top earners. And that's just a small part of this year's massive state budget, which was approved this week by the state legislature in Albany. The $212 billion spending plan will also legalize mobile sports betting in New York, provide a huge boost in education aid, expand access to high-speed internet, and a lot more. Senate Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins. This is all pretty incredible when you take a moment to remember the many challenges this budget brought with it, a pre-existing deficit, a global pandemic, and questions about how to best advantage, take advantage of this federal aid package and not lead to a fiscal cliff. At the start of the year, New York's finances were bleak. The state was facing a $15 billion budget deficit over two years. But things turned around in early March when Congress approved about $12.5 billion in aid for New York. Now that money is being used to close the state's budget gap and fund new programs like a $2.4 billion relief fund for tenants and landlords. Senate Housing Chair Brian Kavanaugh says that could be enough to cover the total amount of unpaid rent during the pandemic. Um, we're not really going to know until we get the application process up and running and we get applications in, but $2.45 billion certainly should go a long way toward covering a lot of the rent that's necessary. And New York will also make an historic investment in education aid over the next year. Cuomo and lawmakers agreed to boost state funding for schools by $1.4 billion for a total statewide of nearly $30 billion. And that came with a commitment to send billions more to schools over the next few years as well. Jasmine Gripper is the executive director of the Alliance for Quality Education. And so what that will mean on the ground is smaller class sizes. What it will mean is guidance counselors for every student. It means sports programs, art and music in every classroom, things that we have been severely lacking in New York State, especially in our highest need communities. Lawmakers also agreed to set aside $2.1 billion to benefit workers who couldn't access unemployment during the pandemic. That money is targeted toward undocumented workers who aren't eligible for unemployment. The so-called excluded workers fund became a contentious issue in the final days of the budget, causing a rift among Democrats in the legislature. Some were against the fund altogether, while others wanted a larger investment. That included Assemblymember Marcel Mitenius, who joined a hunger strike with advocates before the budget passed this week. These folks have not received any money for over a year. They have families and they have children to feed. They are tired of asking. They are here putting their bodies on the line to demand that the government step in. That is our job. 
And with all of that and more, New York's state budget will be nearly $20 billion higher than last year. And that's partly because of what New York got from Congress. But the state is also boosting spending this year at a higher rate than past years. Patrick Orecki is with the Citizens Budget Commission, a budget analysis group. We're talking over two years growing the budget from about $173 billion to $212 billion on an all-funds basis. That's a 22% change over two years. It is absolutely a, a massive, um, and certainly in, in recent times, kind of unprecedented rate of spending growth. And that had Republicans concerned when the budget came up for a vote this week. Assemblymember Andy Goodell was one of them. And our overall budget is more than Texas and Florida combined. Even though each one of those states has more residents than we do. But Democrats say they have a plan to pay for it. That starts with new tax hikes for corporations and high income earners in New York. Senate Deputy Majority Leader Mike Gianaris. Uh, we stepped forward and said it's time to change the direction of this state. It's time to make sure that those who are doing well, who, by the way, did even better while everybody else was suffering over the last year, are asked to do their fair share to help us recover. New York will raise taxes for people making more than a million dollars a year and create two new tax brackets for those earning more than $5 million and $25 million, respectively. And the corporate tax rate will also go up for companies that report more than $5 million in income. At the same time, state income taxes will go down for middle-income New Yorkers. And while those tax hikes are expected to raise more than $4 billion in new revenue for the next year, some say it's a risky move for New York. Here's Orecki again. The first is that you have um, kind of an out-migration risk, um, either individuals or businesses choosing to live more or entirely in other states where they can save a little bit on their tax bill. You also have the, the risk of adding more tax liability onto a very small segment of the population. But not everyone agrees with that. Ron Deutsch is the executive director of New Yorkers for Fiscal Fairness, a group that supports the tax hikes. He says that since New York last raised taxes on the rich more than a decade ago, the state has actually gained millionaires, not lost them. After we did this in 2009, when we initiated a millionaire's tax, since that point in time, the number of millionaires has doubled in New York, um, gone from about 27,000 to about 57,000 right now, as of 2019. Also on the revenue side, New York will legalize online sports betting this year. But it'll be a little while before that starts. The State Gaming Commission will be in charge of setting up the new industry, which is expected to generate about $500 million in revenue for the state by 2026. But the budget also included some major policy items, like a new plan to expand access to high-speed internet in New York. Most internet service providers will now have to provide high-speed internet to low-income customers for $15 a month. That's for the base plan, but customers can also pay a few dollars more for higher speeds. That starts in two months. And the state will also study broadband access and affordability over the next year to determine next steps. That's been a top issue for Senator Michelle Hinchy, a Democrat. Uh, many of our communities both either can't afford broadband or they don't have access to it because of the infrastructure. And so making sure that we have in our budget a real plan that is affordable uh, to make sure that everybody, no matter who you are, can get access to the Internet is critically important. And after the COVID-19 pandemic killed more than 13,000 residents in New York's nursing homes over the past year, lawmakers are making changes to how those facilities can use their money. Now, nursing homes will have to spend at least 70 percent of their revenue on direct patient care, and 40 percent will have to be spent on staffing. Senate Health Chair Gustavo Rivera said that's to make sure residents are getting the care they need and keep facilities in check. It is to make certain that most of the money that goes to these, uh, to these facilities are used for patient care. It is a way to dissuade those bad actors who might be getting into this just to make money. Uh, ultimately, what you should be focusing on is taking care of people, and that is what uh, part of what we did today does. All in all, this year's state budget included a lot of the priorities Democrats pushed for this year. And more could be ahead in the next few weeks. Lawmakers have a week off, but are expected to return to Albany in late April. The legislative session is scheduled to end in early June. 
And that's all just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the state budget. With hundreds of pages of spending and policy, there's going to be a lot to sort through in the coming weeks. And a big question in all of this is whether New York is making the right choices to rebuild the economy after COVID. For more on that, I turn this week to the state's top elected money manager, State Controller Tom DiNapoli. State Controller Tom DiNapoli, thanks so much for being here. Great to be with you, Dan. So we now have a new state budget. It's a $212 billion spending deal. There is a lot in there. It's literally packed to the gills. Let's start broad. Give me your initial reaction to the budget. It only passed on um, Wednesday. We're talking on Thursday. So I don't think that either of us have had the time to go through it detail by detail. But what was your initial reaction to it? Yeah, uh, and we're in the process now, uh, just as you point out, of, of going detail uh, by detail, because our, our role now, uh, we have no input to the policy choices being made in the budget, but we do an analysis of the completed budget when it's uh, done, and we, we just started that work. You know, look, from, from where we thought this was going to be a few months ago, uh, you've got uh, better economic news translates into tax revenue, uh, more help from Washington, and clearly you have a decision made by uh, the legislature to uh, increase revenue as well, uh, increase taxes and have some new programs to generate revenue uh, because there was a decision made across the board to do greater investments in areas like uh, education, healthcare, relief for those struggling with the COVID pandemic. So, so I guess uh, the first takeaway is what, what we thought was going to be a very tough budget year with, with difficult choices because of limited uh, revenue turned out to be, uh, you know, a, a, a more contentious process because we had all this money uh, that hadn't been anticipated, right? So sometimes the budget is late because, you know, you're debating what are you cutting and sometimes the budget's late because you got more money than you thought you were going to have and you're debating on spending. So there's, a lot, there's still a lot to analyze. And so the budget that's been adopted is one piece. The, the next and in many ways equally important piece is an update of the state financial plan. And that will come you know, probably within the next 30 days. So that's what we're, we're really going to look at. How are we dealing with the issue of recurring spending and recurring revenue? So as you alluded to, there are some new revenue raisers in the state budget this year. Uh, lawmakers have opted to raise taxes on the wealthy. And in a statement after the budget was passed, you alluded to some volatility that that may cause. This is something that we've done over the years, but obviously we're in a unique financial situation right now. Can you tell me what you meant by volatility? And do you think the tax hikes are a good idea? Well, you know, look, I, I, I respect the role of the legislature and the governor. I mean, they're elected to make the policy choice as to whether something is a good idea or a bad idea. And then, you know, they'll stand for election. You know, I would say this. The, the economy is recovering. And, and it is, in my opinion, it's, it's a more fragile recovery than some people uh, are fully appreciating. And... Uh, it is way too soon to project what will be the implications of these of these tax increases. You know, one of the unanswered questions right now is uh, b because of that volatility, right? Some of it volatile if, if the economy is bad and people aren't working or aren't making as much. Volatile also if change in tax policy results in, as some have, you know, warned that uh, some of the higher income New Yorkers could choose to move out of state. Many of these are folks who already have a second home. And, you know, one of the lessons of the COVID uh, experience is that you don't have to be in New York to get a lot of things done, right? You know, the virtual environment and so on. You know, so uh, I, I certainly understand and appreciate a desire uh, to have enough money to, to spend on the priorities that the legislature uh, had laid out. And, and certainly having a progressive tax structure makes sense. But we do have to be careful and see what the trends are going to be long term. You know, many people are still hurting very much from uh, the economic consequences of the pandemic. And yet there, there is another category of people who've done very well in spite of that. The une unevenness of, 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 of how people are fared through this pandemic, I think, was one of the underpinnings to the desire to, uh, you know, to change the tax structure the way that, it, that, that it's been changed. But, you know, the point of your question, it's a volatile revenue source we need to look carefully to see what will be the impact of these tax changes. 
There's also a $2.1 billion excluded workers fund that was included in the budget. This money would basically be used to provide benefits for people who couldn't access unemployment during the pandemic. We're thinking of people like undocumented workers who just don't have access to that un unemployment. One part of that requires your office to uh, essentially sign off on it before it, it becomes active. And I think that these workers are probably wondering, well, how long is that going to take? When can I get access to this money? Do you know that yet? I know the budget literally just passed, but do you know what the process is going to be and what the timeline looks like here for that? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, keep in mind, many of these workers truly were providing essential services, uh, you know, during the height of the pandemic. Um, you know, we had concern about being written into the you know, into the language, the way it was proposed. The attorney general had similar concerns. And, and frankly, I wasn't really sure why we were being thrown into that. That wouldn't be our, our role. In the end, Dan, the wording was changed in the final draft to, uh, for the control of the word may was put into the language. So we may review. Uh, so we're, you know, we're looking at that to see what that really means and whether or not we would have any valuable input to provide in terms of reviewing the regulations. But but uh, first blush, th there's no requirement for our office to uh, formally sign off or certify, you know, the parameters of, of, of how this money is going to be distributed. There's, there's more language in terms of the attorney general, uh, but, but I believe she put out a statement uh, earlier this week indicating that there's nothing in there that uh, in any way changes her usual responsibility. So so I don't see uh, the, the wording that, that brought us in in any way interfering with, you know, the legislative intent in terms of, of really the, the uh, Department of Labor taking the lead on putting the regulations out there and getting the money into the hands of those who are eligible. I want to end with you on spending. And you and I have talked about the state's rainy day funds before and how we may not be putting away enough money into those rainy day funds. At the same time this year, the state budget is increasing spending by about 9%. It's almost $20 billion over last year. And I'm wondering from your perspective as somebody who manages the state's money, uh, is this level of spending, if we continue this rate of spending increases, is it sustainable? And should we be putting more money into those savings? Yeah. Well, that's where we, we really have to see what the financial plan lays out to see the out years. Uh, it's a great question because we're spending all this money on all these different initiatives, but no additional money to the rainy day funds, to the statutory reserve funds. That's a mistake. You know, we've been saying this good times or bad times. You really need to be beefing up the reserves. We haven't done an adequate job of doing that uh, at all in New York. We're behind other states in that regard. Missed opportunity, you know, from from my perspective. So, you know, the real question about sustainability, uh, I think, is absolutely key in terms of the state's long term uh, fiscal health. We, we have never done uh, uh, an adequate job of aligning recurring spending with recurring revenue. Is it sustainable long term? You know, obviously, the legislature and the governor are, are, are hoping and expecting that it will be. But uh, we're going to have to take a hard look at, at that financial plan to get some preliminary answer to that question. State Controller Tom DiNapoli, thank you so much for your insight. So we'll be on the lookout in the next few weeks for a full review from the Controller's office. But in the meantime, let's hear from this week's panel. Karen DeWitt is from New York State Public Radio. Bill Mahoney is from Politico. Thank you both for being here. Nice to be okay. here. Karen, I want to start with you. This is a very strange budget in the fact that for the past 10 or so years, the governor has really held an iron grip on the state budget process. And that's partly because of who he is, and it's partly because of how the budget process is set up in New York State. But this year, the governor is facing all of these controversies. How did we see that play out in this year's budget process? We saw, we saw the legislature, particularly the progressive wing of the Democrats, get a lot of things that they wanted. They had to make some compromises. They got $4.3 billion in new taxes. They wanted seven. They got a fund for excluded workers, for undocumented immigrants who couldn't get unemployment during the pandemic. And they also got, after 15 years, this campaign for fiscal equity court order finally fulfilled. That order in 2006 said that New York had spent billions more dollars on schools. And uh, Governor Cuomo, well, it kind of fell apart in the Great Recession. It was supposed to be funded, fell apart in the Great Recession. And Governor Cuomo, for years, has said, no, we don't need that. We kind of fulfilled it anyway. And he really didn't want to do that. 
And now that is in there and the spending is up 9%. And the governor's tried to keep it at 2% for years. So really, it's not his budget, that's for sure. Right, and, and as we said in the show before this, the 9%, it doesn't sound like that much to people, but we're talking about, I think it's $18 billion in new spending. It's certainly not a small number. There is quite a lot to go through. I haven't really seen that since the Pataki era. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a lot. And, and it's financed partly by the new taxes on the wealthy, partly by federal aid. Bill, I want to go to you because we had some interesting dynamics in the budget, not only between the governor and the legislature, but within the legislature itself. We like to think that maybe Democrats are going to be on the same page about everything in the budget process. But this year we saw a really clear divide in Democrats in the chamber. Tell me what happened. Yeah, the fight this year largely seemed to be between very progressive young um, Democrats in the state legislature and more moderate, well-tenured dem Democrats. Um, we saw this especially with the Excluded Workers Fund. This program set up to give, it wound up giving $2.1 billion in aid to undocumented immigrants who haven't been eligible for the federal relief programs that other residents in New York have been eligible for. Um, a lot of these supporters were very gung-ho on cr increasing this even more than the $2.1 billion, relaxing the standards for getting the money, and were pretty much on the warpath for a solid week, calling people who did not support um, increasing this by more than a billion dollars, um, racist, xenophobes, things like that. And there, it was some of the most public fighting between members of the legislature I have seen during a budget season in quite some time. Um, we saw a rally just earlier this week where you know they were out there calling out a couple of moderate Democrats from Westchester by name, saying that they were standing with racists, things like that. Um, and so it was much more high tension within the legislature itself than it normally is. It's well, such, sorry, I was just going to say sorry. kudos to you, Bill, for listening to all those hours of debate, because I have to say I could not listen to every hour, but that was buried in about what? About six hours of debate in the assembly where they kind of slowly turned them into changing their minds on their votes. Yeah, we did see when they were passing the big bill in this assembly a couple days ago on Wednesday, mm -hmm. um, some of the socialists, the, the people who ran, promising to not vote for any bills that came with messages in a Necessity, promising to vote against a budget that didn't contain billions of dollars mm -hmm. more of new taxes than this one had. They gave speeches talking about how awful this budget was and how they were voting no. Um, we saw some pushback on the floor right from leadership, like Majority Leader Crystal People Stokes gave a fiery speech at one point saying, part of being a legislator is learning to compromise and you can't always get 100% of what you want. And if that's who you want to be, you're in the wrong place to get things done. And we saw pretty publicly these members just fold. There were three of them who said they were voting no, who later gave speeches saying that they were concerned the entire budget was going to fail if they voted no for this budget, which they said was awful. So they're flipping to yes. Mm -hmm. And it was, the, the members are brought into shape more publicly than you often see. Right. But like, there's often this pressure behind, behind closed doors mm -hmm. for members to switch their votes and support the budget, be team players. But yeah. it's rare that you see somebody cave in such right. a public fashion as we saw with the socialists this week. Yeah, I think it's some of that's a learning curve. They realize that when you get in government, eventually you have to compromise on a few things. But you're right, we don't usually see that play out publicly. That's usually behind the scenes. You know, we saw the same thing in 2019, now that I'm thinking about it, after mm. the Democrats took the majority in the Senate, and we had a lot of these uh, very new, very progressive legislators. I'm thinking of the Alessandro Biagis, the Julia Salazars, and they came in with a lot of energy, and they still have that energy. But I think that they learned very quickly that just because they share a certain set of values, they're not going to be able to influence 30 other members to align with those values. Yeah, but, they, but they're still not happy with that. And they are right. still trying. And they're, I think that this really energizes people, like the ones that you just mentioned, the more um, liberal progressive senators after this budget that came out. They're thinking, this is just the beginning. We're mm -hmm. going to do more. Because they still had a number of tax increases that they wanted that they didn't get. So. So I think we're really going to see that. They're definitely energized now. I think next year is just going to be critical politically because we have the race for governor, which Andrew Cuomo may or may not be in. And will he be point. governor in a year? Yeah. I mean, seriously, right? Yeah. Exactly. We don't, he says he's going, well, I don't, I don't really know. I don't want to say. He may or may not run. Uh, we might have a new candidate as a Democrat for governor. They may be more to the left. That might influence primaries in the legislative level against some of these long-standing establishment Democrats. And I think that makes even these next few months even more critical for them because the session ends in June. There are limited weeks left to get things done. Can these establishment Democrats really put themselves out there and say, don't primary me, I'm doing really good things. Uh, Karen, that brings me to 
This budget is so packed with so many different things. What are they going to do for the next two months? Well, there are a couple things actually on, on the agenda, and one of them is making uh, takeout alcohol permanent. Gr granted, not a big deal, but a big deal to restaurants. There's also this talk of this Adult Victims Act mm. based on the Child Victims Act, that this would be for sexual assault and sexual har harassment survivors, that they could uh, uh, file civil suit even if the statute of limitations has run out. Um, which would put Governor Cuomo, given his current troubles, in a very awkward position of does he support that bill, does he sign it? Um, but yeah, I, I, there's not a lot of big things left, I don't think. There's right. a good chance that the talk will come pretty far away from just standard legislative stuff. Like in theory, at some point in the next couple of months, we will need to start having a conversation about throwing out our masks and reopening everything that's been closed. Um, and a lot of this COVID recovery kind of walking back from the stuff that was put into place last year, that's going to be talked about more and more. And at the same time, I do think this talk about impeachment is probably not going away. And there is a good chance that come June, that will be on the table more than it has been um, in the past couple of weeks as we've been focused on the budget. But that being said, because of that, I would not be surprised if Governor Cuomo comes up with some out of left field, major new policy proposals, so that way the talk turns back to that rather than impeachment. Yeah. And then we also have the Attorney General's report on the alleged sexual harassment and two federal investigations. So the outcome of those is really gonna determine a lot of what goes on for the rest of this year. Yeah, I gotta tell you, now that I think about it, this is the first time in this episode of New York Now that we have mentioned the impeachment of the governor. And the investigation is ongoing, and we, we don't really know a timeline, but hopefully we'll see an update in the next few weeks. But we do have to leave it there. Karen DeWitt from the New York State Public Radio. Bill Mahoney from Politico, thank you both so much. You're welcome. You. And we'll see you back here next week with the latest. Thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET and by the Dominic Ferrioli Foundation.